We are speaking with the renowned investor, Dr. Mark Faber, publisher of the Gloom, Boom, and Doom Report. It's great to have you with us on the Geopolitics and Empire podcast. Let's start with U.S. stocks. It seems like the market is overpriced and the Trump rally may be nearing its end. On top of that, debt levels are, as always, historic with the U.S. Treasury borrowing $1 trillion this year and then again the next as interest rates rise. What, what do you think? Will happy days continue? Will there be a healthy market correction? Or is the market doomed to crash and possibly be blamed uh, on Trump? Well, first of all, uh, we had already a reasonable correction, not by historical standard, but we had a, approximately a 10% correction uh, when the market peaked out on January 26. S&P 2,872. Subsequently, the market dropped sharply, and then it recovered, but not to new highs. Uh, as you said, the market became very overbought, uh, overvalued. It all depends, you know, against what. But it's, say, by historical standards, very richly priced. Now, if someone argues... The market is not terribly expensive compared to Japanese and Swiss interest rates. Well, maybe that's the case. But th these interest rates are also artificially low. So I think in general, we had a market that had gone up since March 6, 2009. So more than nine years now, or almost nine years. And we went from 666 to 2,872. And uh, since February 2016, uh, when the market had dropped quite sharply uh, into a low on the S&P 1,810, uh, subsequently it recovered and it went up without even a size percent correction for more than two years. So basically, uh, we had an unusual situation, an overbought market, a fully priced market, and sentiment had been extremely optimistic uh, just when the market began to decline. I think from here onwards, uh, it's premature to tell whether it's the beginning of a bear market or just a correction. That we don't know yet. Uh, by the shape of the decline, it looks as if, if it's something more serious. Uh, we had a recovery rally, but no new high. And I think we'll go lower here. How much lower? Who knows? That depends on many different factors. But I think we're going to go lower. And looking at the long term, you've spoken uh, of this over the years. Um, it looks like we're in a we have a bond bubble. The pension funds uh, are bankrupt, um, and the central banks just keep printing money to eternity. Uh, you know, we've previously interviewed former Goldman Sachs managing director Nomi Prinz on the program. She's publishing a new book called Collusion: How Central Banks Rig the World, and you've spoken on this how they manipulate the markets uh, in unison uh, and they kick the can down the road. Um, can you talk a little bit about this uh, central bank manipulation as well as the, the end of this road? How much runway or road is there left for us? <laughs> and w when we get there, I know it's hard for you, you can't predict when that will happen, but um, could you talk about that and what it would look like? Well, my sense is that uh, yes, uh, central banks intervened. They have been intervening for decades into markets, but especially after the crisis in 2007-2008, they began to really print money. In other words, with QE1, first in the US, then QE2 followed, then Operation Twist, and then QE3, and when QE3 stopped in December 2015, so more than two years ago, 
the other central banks around the world, in Japan, in, the, in Europe, ECB, and in England, and in China, they began to print money and push down interest rates to artificial low levels. So we have a bizarre situation where the country like Italy, Spain, and uh, Portugal, they have lower government bond yields than the U.S. And this is a pure manipulation by central banks. Now, how will it end? Well, in my opinion, it cannot end well uh, for the simple reason that since 2007, when the last crisis occurred, uh, the level of credit, in other words, the debt in the world, has continued to expand massively. And this time we have uh, excessive leverage, not just in the U.S., but in most other countries around the world. And this growth that has been driven by credit and artificial low interest rates obviously cannot last forever. However, it can last for quite some time. You know, say the S&P drops 20%. We have a problem in the U.S. Who is to say that Mr. Trump and the central bank will not again launch QE4 and QE5 and so forth? So it can go on for quite some time. What happens in these situations is that uh, the standards of living of the average household, the typical household, does not improve. What improves is stocks go up, and we have a widening wealth inequality and widening income inequality. But it doesn't improve the standards of living of the average person. And sooner or later, the system breaks down either peacefully through elections that then punish the excessive wealth through taxes or, well, yeah, taxes, uh, income or wealth taxes, or we can have a situation where there is a revolution eventually. It may not start in the U.S., but it would spread to the U.S., but some regime change then occurs. And... Can you um, just briefly comment on the, the property markets or, or housing bubbles? We know the U.S. housing bubble contributed greatly to the 2007-2008 crash. We're now seeing bubbles in Canada, Australia, London, and other parts of Europe. Would you expect to see these property markets uh, deflate anytime soon? Well, again, a good question. <laughs> the question is, however, when... Many observers have predicted the Canadian property market to go down for a very long time, and it hasn't happened yet. And uh, the same for Australia. It hasn't really happened yet. But uh, prices are no longer going up a lot, that I have to say. And yes, eventually they will go down. And that, you know, in the U.S., the 10-year bond yield bottomed out the first time in 2012, in July, and then again in July 2014. And since then, there has been a rising trend in interest rates. And in my view, uh, the 10 years yield now at 2.9% uh, roughly is twice as high than at the low in other words, the rise in interest rates, in my view, will begin to hurt. The mortgage rate, the 30 years, is now at over 4.8%. In uh, inflated housing market, 4.8% is quite high. Looking at gold and precious metals, it seems gold has blown through the 1350 resistance and looks poised to go past 1400. A number of analysts such as James Turk and Jim Rickards say the true value of gold should be between five to 10,000 US dollars. Is it also possible that the $10,000 price spike that 
perhaps should have gone into gold instead went into Bitcoin. Uh, where do you see gold? Yes, that's a good question. First of all, uh, as I pointed out at the beginning, you know, when you said stocks seem to be overvalued, yes, depends against what. Uh, my sense is that gold and silver and platinum having corrected so much since uh, 2011. In other words, we've dropped uh, 2011 to essentially 2015, December, when we hit the low. And since then, gold has been trending higher. Now, should gold be worth $5,000 or 10000 I have no idea. I have no idea whether bitcoins will be worth a thousand dollars or hundred thousand dollars or a million. I doubt they'll be worth a million, but uh, the rest I don't know. If I were an investor, I would approach the investment scene not by saying uh, stocks are high or bonds are overpriced or bitcoins are overpriced. I would approach the market and say, this is the reality. Central banks are printing money. There is an excess uh, money compared to assets, and that's why assets have gone up in price. Now, I may be smart and say, okay, all assets are overpriced, and I'm going to put all my money into, say, gold, or I put all my money in cash and so forth. But what about if you're wrong? You understand, you could lose a lot of money or miss a huge opportunity. So my suggestion is for investors to be diversified. Now, we talked about real estate just a minute ago. Yeah, real estate is very high, but I think if you don't own any then and you have money, then I would suggest maybe you should buy a house if you like the house because you can live in it and you save rent on your house. So there are different aspects to look at all these investments in general. I'd like to say this. When I started to work in 1970, salaries were high and asset prices, the Dow Jones, the bonds uh, price, gold, everything was cheap. Now, salaries are low. And everything is expensive. And in 2009, the market made a low on March 6th at S&P 2666. Uh, everybody was bearish. Everything looked horrible. But the market bottomed out. And now we have the mirror image. We are at 2,800, whatever. And everything looks fine. And people are bullish. People believe that earnings will go up and so forth and so on. And maybe it's the mirror image of 2009 and stocks will begin to go down and bonds will go down and properties will go down. And that by itself, this asset deflation can lead to a massive recession. A few years ago, China launched the yuan denominated gold futures contracts. And in one month, they're opening their oil futures market. Uh, is it time for us to prepare a funeral for the petrodollar and instead get ready for the petro yuan? Well, I think that's a very good question. First of all, all reserve currencies that existed in history uh, eventually ended and there was a new global currency, like the dollar followed the British pound. And usually... A reserve currency, in other words, a global currency like the U.S. dollar, remains a global currency as long as that country is by far the dominant economy. But nowadays, the U.S. is no longer the dominant economy. It is probably still the largest by GDP. But if we adjust for purchasing power, then probably not. And number two, in terms of industrial production and in terms of global trade, China is by far larger than the U.S. And so it's likely that there will be an alternative to the U.S. dollar. Now, will that be a yuan or RMB-based currency? Who knows? 
But I think there will be an alternative and that the current monetary system will break down. I just don't know exactly what the sequence of the breakdown will be, but I think it's likely that it will be replaced by something new. And I, you asked about gold before. I would say every investor should own some physical precious metals because it's likely that their value will go up. Will it go up to 5,000 US dollars or 50,000 US dollars or 5 million? That depends on what you and I don't know, namely the money printing by central banks. But I think that under the Trump administration, and believe me, he wants to get re-elected in 2020, there'll be plenty of money printing. And what about just briefly China and its new Silk Road? We keep hearing the Belt and Road is going to save the world. Uh, do you think it's hype? Do you think it's real, uh, something China can deliver on? Um, and also, do you think neighboring countries should be uh, afraid uh, of the Belt and Road? Because, you know, I've lived in Central Asia um, and I've, I've spoken to Mongolians, Kazakhs and Russians and they're willing to do business with the Chinese, but they're always very suspicious and, and wary of them. What's your take on the New Silk Road? <laughs> well, my take on this is everybody has become very suspicious about the U.S. because the U.S. has intervened in so many foreign elections. And if there is a leader that doesn't suit the U.S., they just get rid of him in a very vicious and devious way. So, yeah, maybe people or countries are suspicious of China, but China hasn't really invaded other countries, you understand? And uh, the Chinese initiative, which is called Obor, uh, One Road, One Belt, that connects uh, Western Europe to the Far East, this is not a pipe dream. This is not a project of the World Bank that takes 20 years to materialize amidst huge corruption. This is the reality. The rail cars are already moving between China and Hamburg, Rotterdam, and so forth. So this is not a pipe dream. It's being built. And you can argue against China whichever way you want, but at least they do something. When they go into Africa, they build a mine. They don't talk and corrupt local officials. Probably they also do that, but at least they do something. And so the suspicion is probably correct, but the Chinese don't want to invade any country. They have enough problems in their own country. I, I would agree. But, but since you talk about geopolitics, one thing I want to make very clear to you, whatever goes wrong in the world, the U.S. blames Putin, they blame China, and they blame Kim Jong-un of North Korea. But the reality is China doesn't, doesn't have any military bases in Canada, in Mexico, in the Caribbean, but the U.S. has military bases in Central Asia, they have in Southeast Asia and in North Asia numerous military and naval bases. And this is the territory of China. If you're Chinese and you import approximately 50% of all industrial commodities in the world, do you feel comfortable with having the U.S. and its 11 aircraft carriers in a position that could block the access of raw materials to China. Yes, indeed. I mean, for thousands of years, China has always been a peaceful uh, empire or dynasty that have not gone beyond... Well, their... relatively speaking. Right. Um, and speaking of the geopolitics, when the petrodollar, as the petrodollar declines, do you see a major regional, major regional wars uh, erupt? or perhaps even a, another world war breaking out? Because will, will the U.S. seek to go down like all of history's empires and de <laughs> defend its supremacy against the next contender, China? Well, usually when there has been a huge change uh, in the economic 
balance of power. You know, I was, uh, in 1910, for the first time, German GDP exceeded British GDP. When this happened, that a new country came up and established power felt threatened, then the established power always argued, as the U.S. does continuously, we have to contain China. What does contain mean? Uh, contain means essentially to retard China. Well, the Chinese don't want to be retarded <laughs> economically. And it's not like Steve Bannon claims that China is stealing all the property rights uh, from America. They are applying for more patents in the world than the U.S. So they have developed their own technology. And I think the U.S. economy will go into such a mess and recession that the outcome will be, as has been repeatedly the case in history, is to attack someone, to divert the attention, and then there could be a war. That is a possibility. And in that situation, probably you're better off by owning some physical gold, silver and platinum, than some kind of uh, electronic cryptocurrency. Last question here. Uh, you've previously recommended frontier or uh, emerging markets such as Kazakhstan, where I, I'm currently living and speaking to you from. Um, besides precious metals, you've mentioned real estate. Uh, is there anything else individual investors can do to survive and thrive in a precarious global economy and geopolitical situation? Well, as a general rule, I would always say you should be diversified. You shouldn't keep all your money in one country. Uh, that may work out very well for a while or for a very long time. But uh, when I look at uh, families that have essentially preserved wealth over centuries, they had uh, a certain diversification of the assets in different asset classes and also in different geographical locations. So I would suggest if you're a U.S. citizen, you shouldn't think any longer of the U.S. as uh, being the country of exceptionalism, but you should think as a world citizen, in which case you should have approximately 50% of your assets outside the U.S. And if you happen to live in China, then I would also recommend to have approximately 50% of your assets outside of China and so forth. So through that kind of diversification, you will probably be able to sleep at night better than if you have all your assets uh, in just one investment like stocks or bonds or cash. The banks can also go bust. Or if you have it all in treasury bills, uh, the treasury can also default. These are all things that can happen. So my advice is to be diversified geographically and also in terms of asset classes. To our listeners, go and subscribe to the Gloom, Boom and Doom Report. And we thank you, Dr. Faber, for your insights. Well, thank you very much. All the best.